Blacks in technology. Black, 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 blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Black, blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Black, blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Good evening, techies, techettes everywhere across the nation. Welcome to the 53rd episode of the Bit Tech Talks, a.k.a. the Blacks in Technology podcast, a podcast where we, the engineers and techies, are in total control as we guide you on a technologically filled journey through the vastness of space and time and tech. So tonight, oh, well, I'm your host, Greg Greenlee, along with my fabulous co-host, who is, isn't here yet, but she will be soon, Ayori Selassie. Uh, if you haven't uh, checked out Blacks and Technology, go check us out, www.blacksandtechnology.net. Also, check out our technology bar uh, at bitdigest.net. It's the Bit Tech Digest. It's the first technology blog with articles written entirely by African Americans. Uh, so let's get into a bit of housekeeping. What do we have as far as stats? I think we, we pretty much progressed since our last uh, podcast. We, our last podcast was about in January, so we took a little bit of time off. We're back in full swing. We've got a great podcast here tonight, a uh, great guest. Uh, but let me go over some stats. Member count, we're at over 1,250 members nationwide. So that is great, fantastic. Keep joining Black Technology. Keep supporting us. We definitely appreciate it. Twitter followers, we're almost at 4,100 Twitter followers. We love it. Keep following Blacks in Technology. That's at B-L-K-I-N-T-E-C-H-N-O-L-O-G-Y. Uh, also, we have a LinkedIn group. Our LinkedIn member count is over, well over 1,500. Uh, so go check us out on LinkedIn under Blacks in Technology. Also, our Blacks in Technology Facebook page is www.facebook.com forward slash Blacks in Technology. And if you are listening in right now on this podcast and you want to send us questions, you can either email us, contact us at blacksintechnology.net or use the hashtag Big Tech Talk. So tweet us and use hashtag Big Tech Talk. Tell us how you like the show. Tweet us about topics you'd you like to hear in the future. Tweet us some questions for our guests. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah, our newsletter. We're going to be starting a new newsletter uh, starting out this month, and we are looking for anyone who wants to, you know, pretty much be in a newsletter. If you're a tech entrepreneur, if you want to talk about your business, if you have an event coming up, Send us suggestions. Send us what you're up to. Send us whatever. Let us get it into our, our, our newsletter. We have well over 1,600 subscribers to our newsletter, and it's just a great outlet to get out, um, you know, your news and what you're up to and what, what Blacks and Technology as community is up to. So send us that. Contact us at blacksandtechnology.net if you want to be included in the newsletter. All right. Now on to the show, the big show. Our big guest tonight is Kelsey Hightower. Kelsey is a is a, a software engineer. Uh, he's a former director of Eng uh, a director of operations at Puppet Labs, and he is now the director of engineering at Monsoon. We're going to talk to him tonight. We're going to talk about DevOps. We're going to talk about automation. We're going to talk about Puppet. This is a great podcast for any anyone really. If you're a developer, if you're a systems admin, if you're a systems engineer, this is a podcast you need to be listening to because this guy right here is about to put you up on game. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce Kelsey Hightower. Thanks, Kelsey, for joining us tonight. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm kind of excited. And uh, congratulations on the success of the show. And uh, I really like what you got going on here. Oh, definitely appreciate it. Definitely. Um, so let's, let's let's get it. Let's tell us a little bit about your background in technology. Tell us how you got started in in tech. Uh, so I got started actually right out of high school. So you know I did about a semester in college and kind of decided you know I wanted to work for myself, kind of like a lot of young ambitious people. So I opened a computer store, um, and this is back in you know, like ninety nine two thousand, and kind of had a computer store kind of close to where I grew up. Um, you know, towards the end of my you know, uh, teenage years in Atlanta. So I opened up a computer store, and we specialized in doing service calls. So, you know, we would go out and, you know, get people set up with the Internet. This is when uh, high-speed Internet started coming out from, like, down south back in the day. So you kind of had, like, DSL connection, but you needed someone to come install it. Uh, we would mm -hmm. do things. It was, it was funny back in the day when everyone had a virus, and you used to get your, you used to take your computer.
computer to a computer store to get it repaired and cleaned of viruses. Exactly. So, so that was the thing that kind of got me started. So, you know, I did that for about three or four years. And, you know, once I kind of settled down in life, got married, I got my first job at Google, and I worked in the data center, and took various jobs around system administration. And, you know, towards the you know, last five years, I've been focused mainly on development. Started out with Python, got into Ruby when I was doing development at Puppet Labs, and now these days I'm kind of focused on, you know, the Go programming language from Google. So I've had that journey from sysadmin, uh, to automation engineer, and in some cases, full-time developer. Excellent. A very, very diverse background, sounds like. And I, and I like that, you know, uh, that you, you know, spotlighted that you started, you know, just from kind of a support uh, standpoint, you know, with your with, with your company, uh, and that you moved into, you know, more of the operation side of it, and now you're into uh, more of development and software engineering. So that's, that's a pretty good journey. Uh, I first heard about you when you were head of IT operations at Puppet Labs. Actually, a gentleman that I know who's really uh, into uh, Puppet, and he kind of got me hip to Puppet, um, is uh, Ronnie Hash. Uh, and he is a uh, uh, kind of uh, engineer. He, well, he's not kind of. He is an engineer. <laughs> out in, uh, He's out in San Francisco. He's originally from Cincinnati, but now he's out in San Francisco doing his thing. Uh, and got me hip to Puppet. And uh, I think I was looking at some 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 videos on Puppet. I think some talks at Puppet Conf, and kind of ran across you. And I was just like, "Oh, I got to get this guy on on the podcast." Uh, so happy to have you here again. But tell us how how did you become head of IT operations at Puppet Lab? How was that? How did that come about? Well, I, so Puppet Labs was probably one of the I think best decisions I ever made in like my IT career. So I traditionally work for much larger organizations where, you know, you're kind of a cog in the wheel, and, you know, I've always found my way to be uh, impactful. So at any company, regardless of size, if you do good work, you'll find your way to influence. But Puppet was the first company where, you know, they were a startup at the time. I think there was probably no more than maybe 50 people at the company. But they, they very much pride themselves on you as an individual. So they definitely help you kind of grow and promote your own brand. I don't think I got a Twitter account until I started working at Puppet. Oh, wow. The way Puppet, yeah, Puppet was very well connected. The engineers there were really connected. So I came on, uh, I was using Puppet very early on. So when Puppet first came out, I had an opportunity at a company I was working with to bring in Puppet to automate everything. And, you know, it really worked out well for us. I mean, within about two years, we basically had push-button deployments, and that's like the holy grail for a system administrator where, you know, developers check in code and almost anyone in the organization can push a button and deploy that code. So that was a big milestone in my career, especially as far as me understanding, like, the powers of automation and not just the lip service, but mm -hmm. actually seeing it offer real value to a company and it results in, you know, a net win on the bottom line. So when I started using Puppet, also kind of embraced that whole open source technology view on things that I can mm -hmm. actually contribute to a product. So, you know, traditionally, you buy a piece of software, it gives you a list of features, and you use it. If it doesn't support the feature, you may call your sales rep and see, you know, if they'll help you out. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, it was totally different with Puppet, right? With Puppet, it's an open source project, so you can fork the repository. So if I would run into bugs or I saw a bug that I really wanted to fix, the nice thing about the open source community is that you can just start, you know, taking tickets, Pushing your fix and giving someone that works at Puppet Labs or in the community to review mm -hmm. your code and get it merged in. So that kind of led to a talk at uh, the first Puppet conference in Portland. I remember going out to that, and you know our company was embracing. You know this is when DevOps was the big buzzword. It's still yeah. really popular now, but yeah, I remember when it hit the scene. Um, I was like, I want to go give a talk at, at Puppet Con, and you know they they agreed, and I did a talk on uh, a new piece of technology that came out from Puppet Lab, and you know, it's one of those things is we, a company like Puppet really likes ambitious people, especially people that are contributors in the community, that use the product, that love the product. So, you know, we talked to a few people, and it's funny. I got back from the conference, and, you know, I put in my two-week notice because I was going to actually be joining Puppet Lab. Wow. So, well, I mean, how did, how did, your, how did your, your, your job take that? I mean, you... 
you 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 get them to kind of buy into a puppet, and then you know you get them to hey say hey you know yeah you can go out to this um and and speak at puppet conf, and then while you're out there <laughs> you, you get a job at puppet. Well, so I I kind of considered myself as one of those people that was very collaborative, where people knew that I cared about their success, not just mm-hmm. my personal success, but if I would build a piece of automation, I would build it in a way that would make someone else's job better or make, their, make them more powerful at their, what they do day to day. So if you think about it, I was a guy building at the time, you know, the Iron Man suit. And if I did it right and they put that suit on when it was time to go to action, you know, mm-hmm. they would do well. And if they do well, then, you know, it makes me look good as well. So throughout my career, people kind of saw me building up to it. I started getting really involved in local meetups. And it's like people kind of had the feeling that I've kind of outgrown where I was. And Puppet Labs was an excellent platform for me. So surprisingly, people were really supportive. People were really happy that a product that I cared a lot about, you know, I prided myself on automation, and I was able to go take it to a next level. So it's almost like I had that feeling that I was an alumni of the company, and they were really proud to see that someone from, from there was able to, you know, make it at Puppet Labs, which was a fantastic feeling. So I think you get that when you're doing good work. That's excellent, and and I'm I'm glad you touched on a couple of things. Uh, uh, one of the main things was you know you you know having the courage to go out and give a talk at a conference, and 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 we're gonna talk we're gonna talk a little bit about that. I think that's really important, especially uh, within uh, the black IT community, is you know that we we start you know making ourselves more visible uh, and and getting out to these conferences we can and and give talks, you know. Um, but we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. No, so uh, I actually, I actually, actually that's a topic really close to me. We can actually, if you don't mind, we can talk about it now before we forget. But, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I, I always get that, you know, I actually worked at a company before and no one meant any harm. And a question came on there, like, how does it feel to be the only black guy at the company? And the thing for me is that that has always kind of been the case that most companies I worked at, where you're like the only black guy in the group, the only exactly. black guy at the company. And the truth is, no company, at least the ones I've ever seen or interacted with, do it on purpose. And mm-hmm. it really reminded me that it's on the individual to make the effort. If you want to work at Puppet Labs or you want to work at some company that you admire, then you have to do things to make them admire you as well. Right? It's a two-way street. You know, there's no yeah. handout, which I personally prefer, that I don't have to have a college degree to kind of call my own shots or apply for the job that I really want and earn the skills to, to do it. And you said it right. It's like if you think there should be more blacks in technology, then you need to go to the local meetups. They're all free. You know, last time yeah. I checked, most of them don't charge. So if you're not attending these things, uh, in many cases, you could just order a $50 book off of Amazon and basically be taught by experts in our industry on the latest and greatest pieces of information. So there's almost zero excuse to you know, why there aren't more uh, black people in technology. Now, one thing I do, you know, acknowledge is that there's an exposure problem. So I do a lot of free workshops where I can try to help with the exposure. So if you go to the inner city, I grew up in the inner city when I was in Long Beach, and you could tell the things that yeah. were on our minds was like sports or, you know, things like that. No one was, you know, building their own computer or doing any soldering. Not in my neighborhood. You, you know, you're playing basketball or something like that. So I think yeah. we can, it's not that, Black shouldn't be into sport, is that we should expose our kids to even more. So I have a daughter myself, so I make sure I expose her to things she likes, things that are fun. And I also spend time to teach her what I know. And yeah. we'll teach her a little bit of programming. She'll, she has her own computer. So I, I try to do my part. So, you know, I think you're doing a great job as well in the community of giving people a form and a platform to discuss it. But I think it's time now where there is no limiting factor other than our own choice to participate, especially once you know that you can participate. Yeah, and I, and I, and I, I totally agree. And, you know, I, I think that there, there's a little bit of intimidation when it comes to, you know, as far as like, you know, maybe I don't know as much as this person or, or maybe, you know, this talk is not going to be uh, a good enough talk or, you know, is it up to par with the, with whatever, what everyone else is talking about? How do you kind of get over, over that hump? How do you, you know, kind of say, Hey, you know, I'm just going to go all out. And because obviously once you do the talk, 
other talks become much easier after that. And you really you get all the jitters and you get all that, you know, anxiety and everything. But how do you how do you prepare for something like that? So one thing that for me is like I'm 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 one of those people that kind of became conscious that it doesn't really matter what people think. And I know that's like a unique attribute that not everyone has where you have that yeah. urge and you know, so if you don't have that, the good thing is if you just go to the meetup, the first meetup you go to, you're not obligated to talk, right? You're not even ob- obligated to introduce yourself to anyone. But the, the fact that you're there and once you see the people give these talks and you start to say, wow, I can do that. I know that too. And you get with the person organizing the conference and what you will find, and I think this is like the best industry in the world when it comes to people being collaborative. You go to mm-hmm. these meetups, and you just think about, just step back for a second and think about the concept of a meetup. You have a bunch of people that are volunteering to share information with each other and do it in a way that's encouraging other people to learn from each other. Yeah. That, that is like the perfect platform. So if you understand that and you just show up and you kind of express to someone, like, well, man, I wish I could give a talk, but I'm just learning. You're the perfect person to give a talk. Because a lot of times in our career, we kind of forget some of the basics or we yeah. start looking at things at a different lens. And I've learned so much from new people. Like when I'm giving a workshop or I'm giving a talk and a, new, and a newbie, you could say, will ask a question. And you'll say, huh, I never really thought about it that way. And we're both learning from each other. And I think that's what gives people the confidence to do it. So for me personally, I just say, you know what, I can give a talk. And I gave a talk in my comfort zone. So I think a lot of times we think we have to go on stage to impress someone. Yeah. We have to show them something that they don't know. That's not necessarily what that platform is all about. I actually recommend it to some of my peers or, you know, some people that I manage because I actually care about people's career development. And they ask me, what can I do to get better? Yeah. I was like, if you go do a newbie talk or just let people know up front, hey, I'm learning Python for the first time, and I'm really excited about it. I want to know if you guys can help me out. So my talk today is about, I don't know, Feature X. And you do your best to present Feature X, and you let people know why you're excited about Feature X. And when you, at the end, you ask a question, you can actually flip it around since you're not the expert and ask for suggestions. Say, hey, is this actually a good path that I'm on? Is there anything I'm missing? You know, anything I should be thinking about? And you'd be amazed at the response that you get from people because they know you're coming up there, you're being humble, you're asking for help. And the majority of people in the crowd will be like, look, let's give this guy some good information that he can use to prepare himself. And now you found that community and you found that support system that's going to allow you to grow. And the good thing is this doesn't have to be at your job, right? You could be working at McDonald's and you decide that you want to do this on the side. You don't have to have a job as a programmer to start getting those skills, which is the fantastic part of this industry. Excellent, excellent advice. Um, I, I like, you know, the fact that you, you touched on, I mean, basically, you don't have to know everything in order to give a talk. It, it's, not, it's not a requirement that you do. And as a matter of fact, nobody does. And so to get up there and, uh, you know, and talk about what you know kind of helps solidify, you know, your knowledge. Because what, what do they say? They say, um, you know, if, 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 uh, if you can explain it, then that's, that's how you know that you really know it. Uh, and it's, it's good to it's good to be able to you know kind of speak about it and and I've I often found found that I might have some knowledge in my head and I might have a good idea on on what it, on how it works, but the minute I start talking to somebody about it uh, and really getting in depth and, and talking about what I know is when it really solidifies, and I think that's important for you know for people who are thinking about giving a talk and might be, you know, kind of apprehensive uh, towards getting out there and putting themselves out there on, on, on stage or wherever. Um, they, I, I've actually had a, um, a talk with uh, a gentleman who is, is very smart in my, in my opinion and who has a lot of experience. And every time I talk to him about giving a talk, his, his ex- ex- excuse is, is that he wants to give something new. Oh, people have heard that before. Or people are, and I'm like, well, not everybody. You know, not everybody. So you have to understand when you go to these conferences, these are every every year. There's not the same attendance, not every single year. There are new people that are new to the industry or maybe new to that particular software or maybe new to that particular technology who has never 
touched it and want to learn more, and you might be the person to help them out. And then, like you said, if you once you get up there, you start talking about it, you let them know, hey, you know, this is something that I'm passionate about. I don't know everything about it. Uh, and, you know, don't be scared to – people – I've never been to a talk where people get flamed. Right. I've never been to a talk where people are just like, oh, no, boo, get off the stage. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, I've heard people, you know, question some things like, hey, well, what about this? And people will flat out say, you know, I don't know. That's I'll get back with you. That's, that's something, you know, that's something worth research and I'll get back with. you. Or let's talk. Let's talk after my talk and we can, you know. Better break this down. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I, mean, I think you hit on it. I mean, I've worked with a lot of senior engineers that, you know, a lot of engineers actually suffer from the same thing. We call it imposter syndrome. Where everyone <laughs> thinks there's this legend of a programmer who doesn't look up anything online. He writes code and is perfect the first time. And the truth is that person really doesn't exist. There's probably one or two of them, who knows. But the truth <laughs> is, is that most developers are, you know, they have to research things, especially in this world where now you're working on four or five different projects at your company, switching between JavaScript, Ruby, Python, or as a system admin, you're switching between, you know, sometimes you're working on VMware, sometimes you're working on the network switch, sometimes you're working on some new code written in Perl that you didn't necessarily write. You're always going to find yourself trying to research and, you know, find the right solution. So the, 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 mm -hmm. I think the thing that you want to master is how do I, what approach do I take to solving problems? And one is understanding where you are, knowing where to look for information, and building a network of people that you can actually communicate with. And then you basically equip yourself with enough tools to solve pretty much any problem in the world. It doesn't always have to be you that actually performs the keystrokes that solves the problem. It's just the fact that you're collaborative, you're in the community, and you just know where to look and ask questions. Got you, got you. So I want to I want to get into uh, another question here, uh, real quick. If you're listening in, this is uh, Big Tech Talk episode 53. We are here with uh, Kelsey Hightower. Uh, we're talking about uh, you know speaking at conferences. We're going to be getting into some uh, DevOps, what automation is. Uh, if you if you want to send us a uh, a question. Uh, either email us at contact us at blacksandtechnology.net or you can tweet us using the hashtag Big Tech Talk. Uh, so we're going to get into the uh, next question here, Kelsey. We talked about, I mean, you kind of touched on, on automation and configuration management, uh, but we really didn't get into it. And most of our listeners enjoy getting into the weeds uh, and tech, the bits and the bytes on the nuts and bolts. So tell us about what configuration management is. Tell us what automation is and tell us why both of those are important for you know, today's systems admins, uh, systems engineers, and developers. Yeah, so I think uh, at the high level, you know, no one likes doing repetitive tasks, right? And maybe there are a few people that do. But, you know, when you get, uh, let's say, creating users, that's, that's a very tedious task. You know, you get people that come on and off board from a company. And logging into a server and creating a Unix account all day long isn't mm -hmm. a very fun job. You know, you're probably not going to grow skills by doing that. And the first thing you want to do is understand this concept of it's a computer. And computers are really good at doing the same thing over and over again. And that's when the light bulb goes off, that if you had a program, um, you could actually make your job much easier where you can just give it input, and it will, it will perform those re repetitive steps in the same way every time. And that's when you first get into the idea of scripting, right? So the first thing we want to do is go out and build our own little miniature programs that automate these various sets of tasks that we have. And, you know, the thing about that is that you don't necessarily have the time to build the most ro robust program and tool, telling all the errors that could pop up, and you may not have the time to build a web GUI on top of it to make it more user-friendly for other people on the team. Mm -hmm. So what, what has happened over time is that concept of automation and building scripts has turned into products, right? And there's a many configuration products out there, and, and specifically like Puppet, where it took that body of, like Puppet was basically built by a system admin, right? So looking mm -hmm. east was, you know, a system admin. So he kind of built tools focused on solving system admin problems. And this is why Puppet is kind of designed the way it is. It's designed with the system admin in mind, not someone looking at a reporting dashboard with buttons to push. So Got now it. that, right, so these scripts have progressed. Now you have tools like Puppet that encapsulate 
all the things that sysadmins have been doing for years into a standard tool that you can basically, if you learn the skills once, you can go to the next company and say, oh, you're using Puppet. I know what to do here versus, well, we've got these custom sets of scripts. It's going to get you about two weeks to figure out what they do, uh, run them a special way. That's not reusable. So now in this new world of automation, automation has become a product. So now you can actually buy these automation platforms that are configurable enough where they can actually be uh, suited to almost any situation. So it's important because now that that has become the new baseline, I remember there was a time where if you knew how to write bash scripts, you were considered a very awesome admin. Like, oh, he can, he can script out anything. Right? Yeah. And then, uh, when, when, when Perl was big, oh, he can write a Perl script to do that. And that's cool. You know, and then you had that collection of scripts, and this is before I think sysadmins were actually using version control. So you would look in a, a script directory and you'd be like, the scripts are dated. They all have the same name, but they have different dates on them about, well, we don't want to delete this one because we don't know if anyone's still using it or not. So time has progressed. So now the baseline has been reset. People assume that you're going to approach problems starting from automation because we're not managing six or seven servers anymore. Now with virtualization, people are just spinning up boxes left and right. So you may find yourself managing two or 300 servers and you're your form may not cut it anymore. So, you know, you don't have time to reinvent the wheel anymore. People have different expectations for people in our field. Gotcha. You still there? Yep. Okay. Excellent, excellent. So, um, so Puppet, you know, we talk about automation. All of that, it, you know, kind of falls under the umbrella as infrastructure as code. Can you give us a rundown of what infrastructure as code is about? So th that idea, I think it's been around for a little while, right? So it's been around maybe for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Um, and the idea is that instead of you, the human, trying to basically build a run book of all the things you need to do today. So you come into work, you say, look, I'm going to log into these five servers and make sure that they're healthy. I'm going to run these 10 commands. I'm going to put them all in, I don't know, a spreadsheet and see what we sit. And that's mm -hmm. my job. I'm the system administrator. And when people start thinking about this as infrastructure as code, it's almost like you're treating the things that you manage as a product itself, right? If you think about running your own Amazon, you can't manage that one by one. It needs to become a product. And whenever you have a product, it's going to have to have features, right? Like we can create a user in our platform in five minutes, right? In order to do that, more than likely you're going to have to write some code, right? This is that automation thing we were talking about before. Yeah. And now the code has become way more sophisticated because when you think about it, I have to touch a lot of servers and people want it fast. So when I want to represent my infrastructure as code, what I'm going to do is probably write some abstraction layers, right? This is what software developers have been doing for a very long time, and now it's showing up on the infrastructure side. So in software development, it's always like, you know, your your goal is to try to get to just enough layers of abstraction where the system is much easier to use. That's what programming languages do for us, right? We don't we don't program yeah. in binary writing zeros and ones anymore. We use a high level language like Ruby or Python where we can express ourselves and the compiler takes care of the rest. So we have that now, right? So Puppet is like your compiler. You you express yourself to say, Hey, I want this server to be running this version of Apache. I want these two users on it. Now in order to do that, to operate your environment or your infrastructure at that level of abstraction, you're going to have to have probably some code on the background doing these things. So now when you start thinking about, I'm going to try to represent my infrastructure through code, you're basically saying that I bought into this idea that I'm going to put a layer of abstraction in front of my day job or in front of my infrastructure. So if you want me to give you a new server, I'm not going to log into a GUI and start clicking around. I'm going to basically maybe write some DSL code if you're using Puppet, or maybe you wrote some custom thing that just takes a little YAML description of what people want, and they can post it into a web form and click go, and then a bunch of things start happening in the background because you have this layer of abstraction that can do all of this work for you. Got you, got you. And we're, we're talking about, you know, Puppet, and let, I, I just want to throw out three, well, four terms. Um, one you mentioned was DSL. So I want to definitely you know, break that down, let people know what that acronym is about. Uh, the other three terms is 
when it comes to Puppet, is our resources, manifest, catalogs. Tell us about those three and, and, and how Puppet utilizes those in order to do what it uh, does. So when we talk about representing our infrastructure as code, that's a very raw way to think about it, right? That means you can probably write a bunch of mm-hmm. scripts to start managing everything. And, you know, with time, you probably could get very far with it. But when you talk about Puppet, Puppet has added an extra level of abstraction that we talked about, which is necessary to make the tool use, you know, more universal, I would say. So let's talk about the DSL. So most people's first interaction with Puppet, especially if you're using the open source version, is the Puppet DSL. How do you articulate to the infrastructure what you want? So Puppet comes with its own custom language where you can... What, say, is, what does DSL stand for for people who might not know? Oh, so a domain-specific language. Okay. So this is something where instead of it being general purpose, you may not want to write a programming language that can do all the things. So you write a specific language to solve a specific problem. Let's okay. say we were talking about a domain-specific language for uh, making our own T-shirt design. Well, in a language like that, we don't need a lot of things. We need something that may say, look, you know, what do you want the image? What position does it need to be in? And then you start having some... Um, Pre-made, you know, pre-made decisions. You may have a function called T-shirt built into your language because you know people will be interacting with T-shirts. You may have a color palette set of things in your library. So when you talk about a DSL, your goal is to lead people in a specific direction and start using more concrete terms, right? So if you're looking at a, a general-purpose programming language like Ruby or Python, you get things like classes and functions and for loops and if statements. But if you have a DSL, you want something that represents more what you're actually trying to solve. So you may have keywords like user and file because those are the things that you want to interact with, not just general purpose set of bits on this. So then things like files have attributes. And since we're talking about a domain-specific language, well, you expect your domain-specific language to be specific about how do you express a file. So a file can have an owner, it can live in a location, and it can have these contents. Those are not things you're going to find in a general purpose programming language like Ruby or Python. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, uh, so go, ahead, go ahead and explain the resources manifest and, and catalogs uh, to the people who are uh, not um, fully aware in, in, about Puppet and, and, and what those are in Puppet. So in, in Puppet's terms, to kind of, you know, they have this idea of modeling your infrastructure as a collection of resources that depend on each other, right? So if you think about a basketball team, you have a collection of resources on the court, and you have a coach, you have a point guard, you have a center, you have a power forward, you have a referee, and they all kind of depend on each other. But the thing is they all depend on the basketball court or arena being there. So you can't have the game without the players and the court and the basketball and the hoop and the net. So Mm -hmm. all things in puppets terms will be expressed as, individual resources. So if you, if you take it to the server level, our server is made up of, you know, from a, at the high level. We have files that belong in a certain place. We have users that can access the system. We have SSH keys. We have IP addresses. There's tons of things that make up a server and make it all work. So Puppet's job or Puppet's way of uh, providing that layer of abstraction is to set these things up and use terms like resources. So a user becomes a resource. A file becomes a resource. So mm-hmm. now you talk about the resources are like your Lego block. You have a collection of Lego blocks. They all have different attributes, different shapes and sizes, and they fit together to do specific things. So if you think about it, once you understand this concept of resources, then you have this, uh, this unit that you can actually describe. So you can describe a file, right? You know the file needs to live here. It needs to have these contents. It needs to have these permissions. It needs mm-hmm. to have these contents. So, all right, good. Now you understand resources, and it maps really well to how you would describe these things in a real world. Hey, what's wrong with that file? Well, it doesn't have the right content. Or you couldn't access that file because you don't have the right permission. Yeah. So now we understand resources, but resources by themselves don't do very much. Uh, it's usually the collection of resources that make up uh, a particular role or capability. So if you think about it, you have, let's say, a web server. A web server has a specific application that's providing that functionality. So you may have a resource, maybe the application itself, the RPM, or the Debian package you install. Let's pick Nginx. 
So Nginx is the application, and that's one resource. So we have Nginx. Well, Nginx has a config file. All right, now we need another resource. We need a file resource to encapsulate that Nginx configuration. Well, there's also this Nginx user. Okay, so now we have an Nginx user. And we can tie those things together into a collection. And there's another container unit before we can get to catalog. Is the container unit of a class. So that class represents a class of server or a role in life. And in that case, you would say this is a web server which has these resources. These resources make up a web server. So what you okay. tend to see is that most servers aren't just going to run a web server with no IP address, right? You're not going to run a web server uh, without access to the Internet. So you have that one class that represents your web server. You have this other class that represents maybe the networking stack and configuration on the server mm -hmm. itself. So now you have two classes. Well, those two classes depend on each other. You can't have a web server so you have networks. So you may want to configure your networking before you configure your web server. And you need a way to tie those things together. And when you take those collections of different roles and responsibilities and you push them together, you end up with this catalog. And that catalog is basically all the things that that server needs in order to fit its configuration or its role in the infrastructure. So that catalog is that final level of encapsulation where you say, not only is this server running a web server, it's also running a database, and it may also be running the application that uses both of those things. Each of those things at a high level can be represented and encapsulated in a public class, which is a collection of resources that when you go back up the stack, it's just a bunch of things that come together and form a catalog. And that's a catalog that you give to a server to make it do all of those things that you've expressed using the Puppet DSL. Excellent. excellent. Great, great explanation on what Puppet is. And and I think it's uh I think another thing, another good point um or something to point out is that uh, you know, uh and I've heard this explained, I've watched some some videos on Puppet is that Puppet is good at bringing your server to a defined state. You know, you, your, your server is here and you want it to be here. Uh, so, you know, people talk about, uh, you know, I've heard people talk about uh, server, about Drift. Um, so, you know, you're, you're, somebody might go in there, for instance, and change a permission uh, on a certain file. And so now, you're, now your server is out of Drift and Puppet is great at converging and making sure that your that your server stays in a specific state or converges back to the state where you originally wanted to. So when you make your changes, you make them, you know, in your public configuration file so that you know that that's the state that you want it to be in as opposed to, you know, you making them directly on the server itself. So you now your servers, especially if you're working with a lot of a collection of servers that are the same, you know, so you got a bunch of web servers or you got a bunch of database servers and they all need to have this and that. And so you want all those, those, those servers to be, to be the same. You don't want them to drift out of, you know, out of configuration. So you do all your configuration and within Puppet, uh, if, if there's any point where, you know, somebody goes on onto one of the servers and changes a file permission or adds something like that, Puppet will bring that back into the correct state. Does that sound... Does that sound right? Yeah, I mean, so that, that's the goal of that's the goal of configuration management, right? So yeah. it sounds really good, but there are problems with the whole configuration management approach. Well, because okay. you do have to take the time to model your infrastructure, right? Let's say you have a very yeah. small infrastructure. So, you know, I'm one of the people that are, are are realists. I don't think that you should just use the tools for the sake of using them. You have to really evaluate your situation mm -hmm. to see what fits. Puppet fits a lot of use cases. Don't get me wrong, it fits a lot of them. But there are some where it just doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. Like if you're only managing one file, that's it. Let's say your company is responsible for, uh, I don't know, managing old school DNS where there's just one big DNS server that, I don't know, so just say it doesn't go down, and you only manage one file on that DNS server. You install one package, and you manage this big zone file by hand. But it's been working for you for years. It's actually perfect. You have no issues. That's a case where bringing in Puppet might not be a thing that is the highest priority on your list because you do have to take time to model and represent all these things. Not saying it's a bad thing, but for some mm -hmm. cases, it may not make sense. And I think people lose that 
when they're having conversations about using Puppet or not using Puppet. And then once you use Puppet, all configuration management has limitations, right? So the limitations are when people don't understand the systems that they're managing, they tend to believe that they can just download a module. And that's one thing we didn't talk about in Puppet, that a lot of these things we talked about can be shared with other people. That's also the, the social part, I think, which Puppet has brought to the industry as a whole. The fact that if I write um, one of these catalogs and the catalog is encapsulated in a module, I can share that with the fellow sysadmin man to say, hey, don't go try to figure out how to install Nginx from scratch. Here's my module that will get you a web server just like mine. But what right. happens when people don't understand how the web server even works? They can't just point Puppet at a server, install a service you don't understand because you still need to manage it. Right? Puppet is not going to manage what goes inside your database. Puppet doesn't do performance tuning on the server once you have it up and running. You mm -hmm. still are responsible for figuring out what those tunables are, what they do. But once you figure those things out, then you feed them back into Puppet so Puppet ensures that they stay that way. So that's the thing I think people are missing sometimes when they look at Puppet. It, it solves, it's a configuration management tool, but mm -hmm. you're still responsible for having the knowledge on the things that you manage. Gotcha, gotcha. That's great advice, great advice. So, say for, uh, we always always advise our listeners to think beyond their job and that you have to understand the industry uh, there, there and as well as the business and their company. So I want to talk about the industry for a minute because I know you have experience that allows us to ask you know, tough questions. So the IT industry is changing, as always. So what do you think are the top three areas of change in IT that our listeners should need to be aware of? So I think if you look at history and you look at the timeline, it, it has never stopped changing, which is the fantastic part. It's why people love this industry. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also the part that means that you have to stay on top of your game. You can't get comfortable. There are people that spent a lot of time learning Perl, and they haven't looked up in a while, and they're having trouble finding you know, a job that's going to come and let them write Perl today. It's not anything's wrong with Perl. Things have just changed. The tools have changed. The things that are interesting have changed. And to me, it's like right now, like I said, that baseline has kept moving. So we talked about three things. The three, number one, I think, is that more and more, especially for the system, men, is becoming a commodity. I don't need yeah. you to watch Nagios anymore and respond to alerts. That's out. Like, I, 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 that is no longer the most valuable thing to me. I need to have a platform that knows what to do. You know, it takes a while for it to get perfect, but I need some tooling in place that will perform the same actions you did. So some intelligence. So the things that are changing is that a lot of things we were used to are commodities. Like, you can get a server from Amazon and start a whole company with no physical servers of your own. That's completely new. Like this whole, you know, cloud thing was a thing that was kind of a buzzword, but now it's just like a commodity. Most people have a mixture of some outsourced compute unit somewhere. You could call it cloud, you could call it whatever you want, but that mm -hmm. is now the standard. So if you don't go out and learn how to operate those platforms and start under, understanding those concepts, you're at a loss because you change the way you do things when you have outsourced computing. Security model is completely different. Access, now anyone in the organization can spin up a server. So now you have to understand that whole self-service model. So number one is that things have become a commodity to the point where the things that are no longer valuable, such as servers, have been outsourced to people like Amazon, Google Compute, Heroku, what have you. And all these platforms provide a big chunk of functionality that people used to be paid to do manually. So that's the big thing that has changed. This is already solid, but for some people, they think it's still a thing that's on the horizon. It's here. Right? It's going to continue <laughs> yeah. to be here to the point where it will make no sense to buy your own systems unless you're one of the people that have true requirements that Amazon can't fulfill. So that's number one. The things that we mm -hmm. do today, the things that made us valuable yesterday, are moving more and more to a connected world, which leads to number two, where most of this stuff is becoming distributed, right? This whole idea of distributed computing. There were talks long ago about having a whole network of systems that collaborate with each other. 
And if you look at it today, when your company writes an application, they're not going to build their own SMS server anymore. They're going to use one of the hosted SMS providers. Um, some people don't start with their own authentication backend. Some, some companies are skipping LDAP entirely, and they're just using this third-party service for authentication. And then they may focus on the thing that drives their business or adds value. So now you have a bunch of these <laughs> microservices, third-party services out there. So when you deploy your app, it needs to connect to like 58 other services that provide value in their own right that get glued together for you to produce some particular product or workflow. So now the concept of distributed computing, which was once reserved for Facebook and reserved for Google and yeah. all these people, is now you're starting to see little small startups saying, we want to start in a distributed model. We want to have our servers have high availability. So with EC2, it's easy to have half your servers in California, the other half in New York. And then if yeah. one site goes down, they give you the tooling to push buttons to have an HA site. I don't know if you've ever tried to do this by yourself, it's really hard to do to, oh, uh, yeah. do this with, with limited networking and resources. So distributed yep. computing is becoming the thing, right? We hit the barrier on how fast the CPU is going to get. People want to store all the data now. For some reason, you know, back in the day, you kind of said, well, this is the important data. We'll just store this and we can throw away the, web, the rest. Now, no one wants to throw away any data. They want to keep it forever, not just to be PCI compliant. People just want the data because now, no matter what product you sell, that data is helping driving, help drive what new features you need to add to your product. So now every company is getting into this world of, you know, I'm not going to use, you know, I'm gonna use the term wrongly, but like big data. So now that you can go get Hadoop off the Internet for free, you have yeah. access to the same tooling that Google was using. So now we've raised the baseline on things like distributed computing. So you see these tools coming out like Packer, SCD, CoreOS. Docker is a big um, yeah, the Docker. big guy on the scene now, and they mm -hmm. enable they enable this distributed computing architecture for everybody. So now it's like if you're not getting these skills today, you're going to be at a loss, right? Because like it's funny, a buddy of mine hopped into one of my I run a I run CoreOS, so it's a new operating system specifically built for Docker, and it uses System D, right? So System D is the new uh, way you manage. That's so the new init system. It replaces all those init scripts. So where now you declare how your services work and interact with each other. So, you know, he got on the box and he was looking for init scripts. I'm like, dude, there's no more <laughs> init scripts in the new world, especially for the newer distros. And he's usually up to speed. But just three years ago, he would have been straight. Now he logged into a server and doesn't know what to do. You don't want to get yourself wow. on that boat. So distributed computing, things like SystemD, Docker, CoreOS, um, these distributed configuration tools like SCD, these things are free to download, so there's no excuse not to go get them. The information we have now on how to actually set up these distributed computing things is, is just there for you to try out at home. So it doesn't even cost a lot for you to try out this anymore, right? Before, you would have to go find five physical servers, a network switch, just to try this out. Now you so, can do real, real quick, and, 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 not, and not to cut you off, but this guy actually kind of goes right into our... our, our uh, which was one of my next questions. So this is a segue right into this. So we have a guy, uh, a regular guy. He's, you know, into networking, system admin. He knows how to stand up servers, configure routers. Uh, he can get in phone systems. Uh, his mom calls him, up, calls him when the Internet goes down. Unfortunately, we've been talking about the industry is changing, more automation, uh, distributed computing. Uh, so he knows that, you know, Google, Salesforce, the world manage their networks in ways that are beyond his level of experience. But he doesn't know how to get that exposure and get hands-on with automation uh, and things uh, of that nature. Give him some recommendations for him to be able to set, to do exactly what we're talking about right now, which is get himself up to speed. How does he get uh, experience with these tools and with these different systems uh, in order to learn this, in order to be to to really stay relevant in in this uh, this industry. So if he's listening to this podcast, that's a good start, right? He, you know, you're actively you're actively connecting yourself to news outlets and sources to learn new things. That's step one. So that's subscribing to new letter, newsletters. That's listening to podcasts about technology. That. Also, you know, I subscribe to, like, uh, sites like Hacker News, right? That's, like, the cliche, and everyone does it. But Hacker <laughs> News is a good source for 
really seeing new things that pop up. And one thing I think people make a mistake on is that they don't click on the links that they don't think is applicable for them. Hey, there's a new programming language that came out. Oh, I don't program. No need for me to click on that. You need to click on that link because there's, hmm. a, new, there's a reason why that new programming language came out. Even if you don't expect to program in that language, find out what was the driver for producing a new language when there's so many that already exist. And when you read that blog post, what you start to see is people articulating. Now in the world of distributed computing, we need a concurrency built into the language. Now that we have multiple CPUs, we need to build a language that can take, take advantage of that. Yeah. And then you start saying, wow, the industry must be changing to the point where people think we need new programming languages to operate in a new environment. So learn things outside of your comfort zone, right? So that would be the first thing. Oh, widen your net. For resources. If you're still looking at Flash dot only, or God forbid you're still on big dot com, you gotta add more sources um, <laughs> into your stream of information. Follow thought leaders on Twitter and be and don't be afraid to become a thought leader, which is always a weird thing to say for someone just getting started or new or trying to keep up. The path to being a thought leader is just making a concentrated effort to say, I want to be at that level. So when you read these blog posts, why are, why are certain people able to create these blog posts? It's because they put the time and effort to learn how to do it. And a person like myself, you hang out on IRC, you ask all the right questions from the people that know the answers, you make sure that you understand it, and then you start communicating. Eventually, you become a thought leader. That's how it works, because then you start filling that blank in with your own ideas. You start thinking about things differently. So we talked about widening your, your stream of information that flows in. and then. If you have a laptop, well, if you don't have a computer of your own, you need to go get a computer that's yours. Some people <laughs> are in IT and they only have the work laptop. I can't even understand that part. Like, if you're an artist. Do you still you run into people like that? Oh, yeah. I still wow. run into people like that where they only have the work laptop. And normally they have a Blackberry in their pocket, but we won't get into that. <laughs> but, but you're doing yourself a disservice. You're yeah. expecting that your job will do everything to get you where you need to be. That's being irresponsible. So you've got to take some responsibility. So if you don't have your own platform to play with, and they're just too cheap these days, you can get a decent machine that will run VMware for three, five, three to $500. There's just no yeah. reason to be in this industry and you don't have your own laptop. Because now you don't have to have, you know, back in the day, we used to have a garage dedicated to five servers and their own switch. You don't yeah, need I remember that. that. <laughs> right? You don't need that. Yep. So there's no excuse. So go ahead and make sure you have a, a sandbox. And this is the most important part, I think, is because at work they pay you to produce a specific outcome. Most people aren't fortunate enough to be at a job where they can experiment a lot of the time, which is okay. That's all right. But when you get home, you're going to have to find some time, whether you have a wife and kids, I have a family, but you've got to find time to say, look, I'm going to take an hour or two, and I'm going to try out something I read in that blog post just to see how it works. So get that laptop and experiment. Get your virtual machine set up and try to play with these technologies. And when you get stuck, go to the meetup and take your laptop with you and show people where you're stuck. And then you're going to get unstuck. So th those are, that's the formula. Learn, open your net up, and then put your hands on it and go ask for help when you get stuck. And I think if you do those things, You'll be the person on the other end where people will be reading your blog and then people will be asking you for help. That's powerful. I, I like that. Uh, I always preach to people um, about having it. I actually did a blog post um, on, on uh, Big Tech Digest. I think it was kind of, I think it was titled something like, uh, everyone should have their own back case, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, pretty much detailing what, exactly what you were talking about. Like in today's, uh, uh, in today's day and age, I mean, if you're in technology and you're looking uh, to be successful in technology and really stay on top of emerging technology, you have to have your own setup at home, you know. Uh, and I was one of those people that, you know, started out with five physical machines here at my house, and I've consolidated to one powerful beefy box that uh, you know that I use I run VMware on uh and that I you know use to experiment 
And I think, you know, just like you said, when, when people are not doing this and they're not, and, and I talked to this, uh, talked about this with, with uh, one of my close friends uh, from the Bit Network, and we really talked about, because there's some manifesto out there, it's a software manifesto, and it talks about how software uh, development uh, it isn't about, you know, making money and it isn't about, you know, creating, it's just about the craft, right? Uh, and, you know, we, we talked about, you know, that just being technology, period, is, hey, technology and honing uh, your, your skills, this is a craft and you need to treat it like it's a craft. If you want to be good, you want to be successful, treat technology and your skill set like a craft. So that means you should be home with your lab, just like you said, spend an hour, uh, or half an hour, if that's all you have per day or whatever, honing your craft, spinning up virtual machines, uh, uh, installing whatever, something, something that you read about that may seem interesting, staying abreast on the latest and emerging technologies and basically staying relevant. Yeah, and, and think about this. Too, think. That you're you're mm-hmm. in an industry where it has already been proven and validated if you do those things, the incentive is there, guaranteed. This is yeah. obvious. Like, there's a lot of industries where even if you put in the time and you put in the work, there is no guarantee or there is not enough open positions for you to kind of move up. That's not the case in IT. No matter where you are right now, if you put in the time to gain the skill, you are valuable. You're already valuable right now. But anything you do to increase that level of skill you have, increase your exposure to things, and actually care about your job, you're definitely mm-hmm. going to be seen very valuable. This is like going to go get a PhD in some in some field. You have an opportunity to do these things right from your own house, very cheap, without the tuition debt. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, if you're listening right now, we're almost an hour into this, uh, but this is uh, Tech Talk episode 53 with Kelsey Hightower. We've talked about DevOps, automation, we talked about how you stay relevant in your IT career, uh, and we're, we've got a, we got a few more questions out there. I want to go to uh, Twitter. Uh, one of my good friends from the Bit Network, Henry, has tweeted us a question. I wanted to uh, pose that question to you, Kelsey. Uh, Henry is a electronics engineer. Uh, he's always on the site. He's very active. Talks a lot about about a lot of stuff that some of it is over my head where I have to go, hey, slow down. What are you talking about here? And he goes and goes about explaining it. Uh, and you know he's a, he's a great teacher um, in, in that aspect. He he's always schooling me on something. Uh, but he has a he has a question for you. Uh, and he, he he writes when doing hardware abstraction, what protections are there for configurations that take the physical hardware out of specifications? What is the mechanism for that protection? Yeah, so to me, it's like I don't really deal with hardware directly anymore, right? It's like the things that I work on gotcha. are at that next level of abstraction. But I did work in web hosting where, you know, we used to get a little bit close to interact with some of the Ray. I remember when we had to automate getting Ray controllers um, and, and in the right configuration. And in that case, you don't have access to the GUI. We didn't necessarily use yeah. the console that's built into some of the Ray cards. And in those cases, you end up, Hopefully, the vendor you're dealing with provides the right hook. So you see this a lot in the maker community when they're dealing with uh, Raspberry Pis and things like this. Mm-hmm. And usually, there's some software library, which is key because, you know, trying to probe this stuff from scratch, that takes a lot of time. So what we're seeing now in the software landscape, especially in the embedded computing world, is where people are shipping libraries that let you interact with the inputs and outputs of the whole board. So as you stick on, like, let's say, a USB interface or some LCD interface, usually there's a library that lets you pick, you know, poke and prod at the different ends and outs of those systems. So I think gotcha. what we're seeing now is all the languages, even JavaScript has a rich library for a lot of these embedded platforms. So when we think about it, it's going to be like now drivers are no longer these binary things that you load into the kernel and you have to reverse engineer to do things. Now people are making all these hardware things abstracted by giving us libraries to do things. And this is why you see Raspberry Pi and the little drones that you fly have direct access to the firmware in the form of libraries or things or toolkits where you just compile them down. Gotcha, gotcha. Thanks for, thanks for uh, answering that question for, uh, for Henry. 
Definitely appreciate that. Um, let's get into a little bit about uh, your career. Um, you started out VP or head of IT operations at Puppet Labs, uh, and you're now the director of engineering at Monsoon uh, Commerce. Mm -hmm. how, did the, how, did, how did this transition happen? And tell us what your day-to-day -day life is like there. So you want to talk about the day-to-day -day life at Monsoon? Yeah, yeah. So at Monsoon, the thing I like about it, this opportunity to, you know, at Puppet Labs, it was like the first time I was able to do full-time development and not just op in operations mixed in. So, mm -hmm. you know, I started out there as a developer on the development team, working on things like Puppet and Solutions, and moved over to um, operations, mainly because of my experience and background, and managed the team of desktop support technicians, uh, system op engineers, and Puppet has a lot of engineers that can code really bright, so it's not much of a, you know, I need a manager to tell me what to do, but it's more of a team building because the company was growing rapidly. But gotcha. that was kind of the things that, you know, I have experience with, not all of it, but it's very much familiar to me. So going gotcha. back into development full-time is very was very exciting. So when I moved to Monsoon, um, you know, they weren't growing as fast as Puppet, and the Puppet is huge now, right? They went from, yeah. you know, when I was there, from like 40, 50 people to a couple hundred people, you know, less than wow. about a year and some change. So, you know, they're on explosive growth. But for me, I like that small scale because everything you do at a small company has a huge impact. And I really enjoy working with the people at Monsoon. And when I got there, all the things I learned at Puppet, it's like I always tell people, when you're working at Puppet Labs, it's almost like working in a research facility because everything that you think of, you can't do because you have to make sure that it works for 80% of the customers that use Puppet. But when you go to a company that doesn't produce technology like, like Puppet, you can actually do solutions that only work for 0.111% uh, of the population, which is just a company that you work at. So you get to experiment more. You get to put things into practice. And as a developer, I was really excited to put my Go skills to test, you know, start mm -hmm. doing services, then run in production, get on board with these microservices and all the things I learned about automation, like new ways of doing it, using the new tools, and sticking that stuff together. And it's like for anyone, you know, you get to a certain point in your career, you have to validate where you've grown with actual successful products. You have to continue building these platforms. And I'm at the point now where I always want to have a challenge of, taking a company from where they are and having a positive impact of either changing the culture, exposing people to new things, not just the newest shiny thing, but yeah. the new things that actually make their, their businesses go. And I was able to do that. So I came in and it's like, you're going to be working directly on the product line. You're going to be managing a group of smart people. I mean, that is just the best experience ever. I don't know if people get stuck with bad teams. They have to work on a bad team. But having a team where you manage a group of smart, mature people Everyone focuses on the problem, and it makes you better. So even though I came in wanting to exercise my expertise, I ended up learning tons more new skills than I had before. So it's been an excellent experience, and the, and the idea of managing an engineering team is a lot different than managing a development team. You know, if they're both in technology, but it's a different set of problems because when you're software development, very strict time-wise that you have to solve. Um, very, I mean, strict problems that you have to solve and strict timeline. And you don't always get to go back and do it over. And when you think about it, in operations, you tend to use off-the-shelf products, right? Get VMware yeah. for virtualization. Use Nginx for a web proxy. But when you're in development, especially when you're working on the core product that adds value, most of the technology for the value you add doesn't exist because if it did, then you wouldn't be adding value. And in those yeah. cases, they have to be creators from scratch under deadline. That's a totally different challenge. Excellent, excellent. And you actually just answered you answered the next question uh, that I was going to ask, which is how how are these experiences similar and how they're well? Tell us about how they're how they're how they're similar. How is heading IT ops uh, and and now being the director of engineering? I know you you just touched on how they're how they're different. But are they, are they similar in any fashion, and so how? They're the same to me because as an engineer, when I was an operations person, I used mm -hmm. to read the Java code that I was responsible for deploying to figure out why I was throwing the wrong errors in the log. I was always reading the code to figure out are the libraries up to date, are they disused, or to add a feature that I've been requesting. Like I remember the first time I wrote some Java, I really wanted the Java code to interact with the infrastructure. 
and no one had time to do it. So I spent the weekend, I learned Java, I produced some code, someone helped me make it better, we merged it in, and I was like, this is how you do things. It doesn't matter if you're in operations, that just happens to be your area of expertise. And when you're a developer, where I'm at now, our developers do their own deployment. In a couple of areas, we don't have operations people. It's not that we go no ops, right? We don't have this belief that you don't need operations people. It's that yeah. the developers had to learn operation practices, how to do deployment, how to use semantic versioning. Everything must go through CI. Build a repeatable pipeline. It's not okay that you do deployments from your laptop. And they embrace those things, and that's just a new norm. So to me, is if you're a developer or you're an operations person, I think companies now are expecting you to know how to do a little bit of both. If you specialize yeah. in an operation, it mm-hmm. might help if you can read some code. It's even better if you can write some code. And if you're a developer, you will always have the luxury of having somebody else deploy your code. So nowadays, I think it's advantageous to both groups learning those things. And when, in my case, whenever I manage a team, I try to bring the opposite element to the team and preach why it's important and not talk about them as two separate things. I think I'm not the only one doing this. A lot of people are doing this. So I think it will become the new norm. So, you know, yeah. the way they're, you know, the way they're different now is, you know, of course they have different skill sets, but the way they're the same, you both have the same goal. Your goal is to ship products, quality products, and put them in customers' hands and meet expectations. And both groups can't do that independently. And I think that's really important that, that, that you that you put it like that because I, I you know within especially within the big community you know I run into people that are kind of only focused on on, on just on just this one aspect uh, and the, you know especially with the way the industry is is moving to more of a software defined type of industry uh, people are people need these you know need these crossover skills so you know you have those systems that and those uh networking people even uh that you might not have really touched a piece of code uh in their lives and now you know they they need to they need to learn some code uh or at least to the point to where they can read it and tell what's going on or whatever uh in 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 a lot of a lot of cases they need to learn how to code um and so you know i think that's a a very very important aspect that you that you just brought up and you just you mentioned go programming language I actually have never heard of it until you just until you mentioned it uh, uh, when you sent us our bio. So tell tell me, <laughs> tell our audience what go what the Go programming language is. Uh, I also think that you you mentioned it in um, in our email uh, threads um, something about a conference as well. So touch on that, and then what made you decide to take it up as a language? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so Go, I'm, like, all in on Go these days. It's like, you know, people will tell you, it's like, hey, technology's coming, Go, and you shouldn't get too attached. Well, to me, I'm attached, mainly because, you know, I'm going to enjoy it while it's here. But mm-hmm. the thing is, it solves so many problems as a, for a developer and for a system administrator. I won't go too much detail about the features of Go, but in general, it's that when you build a program in Go, you can write a script or you can use it like you would use Python if you're in that sort of thing. But when you're done with it, since it's a compiled language, you get the benefits of a compiled language. So most people are used to Ruby and Python, and maybe they started their programming careers out there. But one benefit you get from languages like Java and C++ is the fact that it does a lot of type checking. So a lot of times you may write a script, and you get a bug in there mainly because, you know, you're passing around the wrong data type. You know, you, you were expecting a list here, but you got a map, and the yeah. whole thing blew up. And then you got to do a bunch of defensive programming around that. So Go gives you that type safety that you find in, you know, like Java or C++, but it feels like you're writing Python. And there's no classes, so it kind of feels like you don't do a lot of uh, what they call taxonomy. You don't build a bunch of classes and try to do a bunch of enterprise patterns to write code. You basically write code with functions that tie together and do things. It's, like, really simple. And you'd be surprised at how simple it is to get started with it. So when Go came out, I looked at that and I was like, man, one thing that turned me off about Ruby is that Sometimes you look at Ruby code, and it's like someone's having a competition on how <laughs> clever they can make their Ruby code. And you're just like, I'm not interested in that, man. All I want to do is solve a problem. And what Go does, it's very much about solving the problem, and it's reflected 
in its capabilities and what it presents to you. So the model that it presents to you is that, look, right function, and I'm talking about this at the very simple level. Of course, it's a lot more powerful than this. But mm-hmm. right simple function, compose them together, and you're going to get a working program. And at the end of it, when you compile it down, you end up with a single binary. So I don't have to have go install it on the other side. I don't have to try to pull down a bunch of packages from the Internet every time I do a deployment. I can take that static binary and put it where it belongs. Now, you have to have a binary specific for Windows, specific for Linux. But mm-hmm. all the tooling to do that cost compiling is built in. So there's no make files. There's no make install. Oh, wow. None of that business. It's just built in. So you have to really experience it to appreciate it. But once I saw that, I had this idea in my mind, and of course it will never happen, but if everyone, and no matter what language they have, produce a static binary, then I could just deploy the binary, and I don't have a thousand dependencies to manage. What version of Ruby? What version of this gem? Like, that gets complicated. It gets messy. Um, even though there's tools to solve it, I'd rather not deal with it. So when I saw that, I really lashed on. And when I lashed on, I started contributing to all the new projects that are built into Go, like Packer, you know, a really great tool for automating, building images for, like, VMware and Amazon and building them in parallel, but it uses Go. Um, hmm. I haven't contributed to Docker, but Docker's written in Go. I contributed to SCD, which is written in Go. I actually wrote a lot of my own personal projects written in Go, one called CompD that, you know, a lot of people actually use in production. I've been surprised to find write-ups and blog posts about it. But the most important thing about Go to me was the community. You have a brand new language written by Google. So Google, well, I wouldn't say Google, but some employees at Google, mainly some some uh, legends such as Rob Pike. These guys are legends way back in the AT&T days where, you know, these were all the hardcore units guys were inventing a lot of things we take for granted today. They came okay. together and wrote this language that is basically simplified but encapsulates a lot of the best practices for writing software. Not complicated uh, ways of doing it, but practical ways of building complex software. So having access to those people on the mailing list directly, you can ask these people questions, and they will give you feedback. That is like ultimate. So, and that's why I'm all in on Go. And uh-huh. I think uh, and I've been doing workshops ever since. Wow, wow. So what you're saying to me is I need to go on Go. <laughs> I I recommend, I mean, I do the workshops. I make all my workshops free. And I think oh, wow. people should at least be exposed to Go. Not saying that you have to use it to replace something else. I'm not going to say mm-hmm. that Go is better than this, Go is better than that. But it's a language that came out roughly four or five years ago, at least for general use for other people. And it came out at a time where we had distributed computing. We had all these things we just talked about, and it came out to solve problems of this day and age, right? Because Python, remember, is like 20 years old now. Yeah. Right? People, time flies. So now we have a new language that says, hmm, how we can make something better to respond to today's problems. So I think, like I said earlier, researching why this language is even built, researching why people are even using it to build some of the products we're starting to use and starting to bleed into our infrastructure, it's important, right? It's important for you to know why you don't use it, right? I think that's important. Don't it's kind of hard to say, have you heard of Go? Yeah, you heard of it. Have you checked it out yet? Not really. You might want to check it out, and if you don't like it, that's okay. At least you know why you don't like it. Got you. Got you. That's great. Um, and I want to – we talked about – you talked about some of your, your projects that you're contributing uh, to with Go. Um and and since Go is, is is an open source project, uh, and um, we kind of touched upon open source, but I, I want to, why do you think it's important? And because when I talk to, you know, people within the network and and things, and you talk about open source and contributing to open source, I don't find a lot of people of color contributing to open source projects. And I just want to, and I don't want to, you know, get down to, you know why people aren't contributing, but I want to talk about, you know, why do you think it's important for more people of color to participate in these open source projects? So the thing that I think is the most fascinating thing about open source, the whole world is doing it. And when you think about the whole world, you're talking about people that are from diverse backgrounds on a global level. You got people from China working with people in Africa. You got people in Africa working with people in Atlanta, Georgia. They don't care what your race is. Matter of fact, I've worked with a lot of people 
on open source projects that I've never met before in person. Mm-hmm. I don't even know what they look like. If they walk past me, I couldn't tell you <laughs> that that's the person that I've been coding with for the last week. But that's the perfect part of it. So your race gets left out of it, right? Yeah. And to me, it's like if you want, if you think that, you know, if you honestly believe that the color of your skin is a thing prohibiting you from collaborating with people on things that you're interested in, uh, preventing you from entering into this open source community where all this energy and knowledge is flowing freely. Mm-hmm. Just think about it. These people are working using tools like GitHub that are making it very easy for you to collaborate. The nice thing is no one's paying you to do it, so there's really no expectation that, you know, you deliver it by a certain time. You can take it as long as you want. So if yeah. you find a bug that you want to fix, you can take a month to fix it. And then when you're ready, you, you push it. And you get a free code review, right? Someone says, hey, thanks for contributing to my project because you didn't have to do that. You did this on your own time. You're helping me out. So the best, the least I could do is help you out and say, hey, it looks good, but you might want to do this different, do that different. And then you go through this cycle where you're mentoring. You're being mentored for free. So it's one of those things where it's not even about your initial set of skills. It's about your mm-hmm. willingness to participate. And it's not all about code. Right, we hear open source, we think open source code, but most source core projects or most projects have documentation. Maybe you contribute by writing the documentation. Let's say you're from a country in Africa and you speak a specific dialect, and you know that people that use the tool could could be served well by the documentation being written in that dialect. You could offer value there, right? Because this is these products are being used on a global scale. So yeah. almost everyone in the world has something that can contribute. Very, very, very interesting. And and I, and, I, and what I gather from that and, and what you're saying is basically, you know, contributing to an open source uh, uh, project is basically like mutual improvement, right? Uh, you, you're 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 sitting there, you're collaborating with somebody whose skill set they may be better than yours or it may not be. You may be teaching them something. They may be teaching you something. So you have that kind of that mutual uh, improvement. And and what I like about that is uh, when we talk about uh, the organization like Box and Technology, it's not all about, uh, uh, you know, black people and technology, right? It's about us coming together to improve each other. Uh, in this in this industry, not only making ourselves more visible, but, to, but on a participation level uh, and on a um, uh, on a, a level, you know, an exposure level, right, uh, a, a perception level. But not only that, but on a skill level, right. So we, we come together, we get into our form. Uh, we actually have an RC channel as well, but we, you know, we talk about things uh, in technology. It's not about, you know, it doesn't. A lot of our, our talks and our discussions don't boil uh, uh, don't boil around, you know, talking about race or anything like that. They, they mainly talk, you know, we mainly talk about technology, right? And you know, people might not know about something like Henry. He'll get on. Uh, I mentioned Henry earlier. He'll go down there and he'll talk about, you know, uh, 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 you know. Let's say, for instance, like radio waves or something like that, something that I might not even know about. And I'll sit there and I'll chat with them. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm not familiar with that. You know, he'll talk about a project he's working on, something, you know, deep in tech and it has to do with electronics. And just that, that collaboration there, that communication uh, alone helps build us, our skill sets up individually. Uh, and so there's that, that mutual improvement that, that you know, Black Technology tries to fo- really tries to focus on, and that's why we're you know try to collaborate with uh, organizations that can bring those type of resources uh, and 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 provide that type of knowledge so that our skill sets are improved and on par with where, where everyone else's are. Uh, and so you know that's, I, that's what I really love about podcasts like this is that you know we 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 might touch on things about uh, about race, but we really focus in and try to hone in on technology and providing people with with uh with knowledge and and and, and skill and you know maybe even some questions that people can go and, and research on their on their own and and develop their skills uh even further so uh with that said and then, you know i want to i want to definitely thank you for coming on the podcast i know i've been trying to get you on this podcast for quite some time you know dealing with our schedules and things like that it hasn't come together but finally it has it was a fantastic podcast, a lot of great information. 
Um, but t- before you go, tell us, you know, how people can, you know, follow you on Twitter or how can they get in contact with you? How can they follow? I'm going to follow this up with show notes. I know you're, uh, um, uh, some of your uh, projects are a Packer. Um, that's utilizing, is that utilizing the Go language? So I'm going to definitely post that link uh, on a podcast. Uh, you have a workshop. I think this coming up on Eventbrite. I'll go ahead and post that link. Uh, what is it? Your co-editor of GoLang Weekly Newsletter. Uh-huh. All right. I'm going to post that so people can follow that as well. Uh, you're going to be at um, GopherCon. When is, when is GopherCon? Uh, GopherCon, I think it's on the 24th. It's in Denver. So a lot of the uh, people, you know, contributing to Go at all levels will be at this one-day conference in Denver. Okay. Right, two days. And, and you know, even the creators of Go will be there giving talks, which is which is a really awesome experience. And I'll have the pleasure of speaking. So nice. uh, yep, that's coming up, uh, you know, a couple of weeks. Okay. All right. So I'll post that link uh, to GoForCon uh, dot com. Uh, also, there's a couple of talks that you have and uh, you've done in the past, um, and I'll post the links on their YouTube videos so people can go and check them out. Uh, but go ahead and give us like, you know, if you want people having your Twitter handle or yeah. how they can follow yeah, you. Most, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Most people, yeah, most people, you know, I interact with people on Twitter, so I'm at Kelsey Hightower. Um, I use my real name everywhere, keep it simple. So if I'm on IRC, <laughs> Kelsey Hightower, my email address, uh, you know, you can probably figure it out at gmail.com. And, yeah, but I like interacting with people real time. So on Twitter, people may ask questions, you know, you know, how to get started or if they're using maybe some code I wrote or just want to chat about IT in general. I'm mm-hmm. happy to do it. Um, so I, that's nice. my support platform these days is Twitter. Real quick, right? You don't, you don't have to get in long conversations. You've got 140 characters to get your point across. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, hey, man, I, I definitely, once again, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, it's been a long time coming. I'm glad I got you on here. Glad we talked about, you know, everything from DevOps to your to engineering automation to go programming language, all of us there. Uh, and, you know, this was, this was a great podcast. So I, th- I thank you for that. All right, man. Appreciate it. All right. Take care, Kelsey. All right. Bye. So our next, uh, in, okay, he just hung up. So real quick, um, in a couple of weeks, we're actually going to be, not a couple of weeks, when is this going to be? I think on May, mm, sometime in May, it looks like uh, May 6th, 15th? Yeah, 15th. We will actually have the CIO and VP of operations of Puppet Labs. I know we were talking about Puppet uh, with Kelsey, uh, we're going to really get into the nitty-gritty of what Puppet is and how it can help systems admins, systems engineers everywhere. You definitely want to tune in for that. That's going to be on May the 15th. That's going to be 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Pacific Time. CIO and VP of Operations, Nigel Kirsten, is going to be uh, joining us on the Bit Tech Talks. And I think we're going to have some uh, another great announcement. There's going to be um, – you know, involving puppet so tune in for that again thanks everybody for listening to uh blacks and technology uh the bit tech talk uh if you want to get in contact with us let's contact us at blacks and technology.net uh you want to send any suggestions on any podcast or people that we might uh need to interview uh tweet us at uh, uh black and technology b-l-k-i-n-t-c-h-n-o-l-o-g-y use the hashtag bit tech talk uh, and I think that's it for right now. Ayori couldn't join us. Um, so next time, hopefully she'll be here. I uh, hope everything is all right with her. And um, tune in next time uh, for Bit Tech Talk. Thanks, everybody. Black, 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 blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Black, blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Black, blacks in technology.